Welcome to this week's Money Metals Podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these treacherous times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the company voted 2015's Precious Metals Dealer of the Year in the U.S., Money Metals Exchange. I'm Mike Leeson, and welcome to this week's Market Wrap Podcast. Coming up, David Morgan of the Morgan Report joins me to discuss the year ahead for silver. He also gives some great advice on how to make and keep profits when investing in precious metals and talks about a tipping point he sees ahead in the silver market. Don't miss a fantastic interview with the silver guru himself, David Morgan, coming up after this week's market update. Well, gold and silver markets continue to press ahead. As the Dow Jones Industrials put in 10 days in a row of new record highs, the gold market rallied itself to a fresh new high for the year. On Thursday, gold prices closed just above the $1,250 resistance level. As of this Friday recording, the yellow metal is advancing again and currently trades at $1,255 an ounce and now registers a 1.5% gain on the week. Turning to the white metals, silver also broke out to new 2017 hot highs. Spotver checks in at $18.36 an ounce, good for a weekly gain of 1.8%. Platinum is up 2.1% this week to trade at $1,026, while Palladium, which had cooled off a bit through Thursday's close, is now also in positive territory thanks to this morning's advance and comes in at $782 an ounce, good for a 0.4% gain since last Friday's close. The bottom line on markets is that metals have momentum, and for the time being, so do stocks. The difference is that stocks are quite pricey and overextended technically, while precious metals markets remain relatively depressed, even despite the recent upward move. Nobody in the mainstream financial media is talking about gold and silver, and few American investors are rushing into them. However, a huge new source of investment demand is now emerging in the Muslim world. The so-called Sharia standard on gold is a set of rules put into place late last year that enables gold to be held as an investment while remaining compliant with religious law. The upshot is that several hundred tons of new gold demand is projected to manifest in the months ahead. Here in the United States, safe haven buying for hard money has been scant so far this year. It could accelerate if inflation fears ramp up, geopolitical tensions flare up, or stock market jitters return. People who are new to precious metals investing often ask us what they can do with their gold and silver bullion once they've obtained it. One perfectly sufficient answer is to simply hold on to it until you're ready to sell. In other words, just treat gold and silver coins like stocks, bonds, or other passive investments. Their value will tend to go up over time. And when you're ready to take profits on your bullion products, you can sell them back to Money Metals Exchange or another precious metals dealer. However, you can in fact do more with your bullion than stash it away with the aim of selling it at a higher price at some point in the future. You can also use it for gifting, bartering, trading, and displaying for conversation. Barter and trade doesn't just refer to picking up stuff at a flea market in exchange for silver dimes. It is also possible to drop contracts for loans or big ticket items such as cars, boats, or homes using precious metals. Gold Clause contracts, as they're known, define gold as the means of payment. They allow both parties to do an exchange and avoid transacting in dollars. Gold Clause contracts can be especially useful in long-term agreements such as loans and leases. If you're going to be the recipient of a long-term payment stream, you can avoid the risks of currency debasement by insisting on gold or silver, for that matter. And if you're going to be the one making payments, offering to pay in gold can give you leverage to negotiate for better terms. A gold clause contract is perfectly legal. That said, there are many nuances that go into drafting it properly. Full enforcement of the contract to prevent dollars from being involuntarily substituted for gold will depend on your state's laws. Toward that end, the Sound Money Defense League is working to promote the use and acceptance of gold clause contracts in all 50 states. Here's an excerpt from a news video released this week which quotes from the Sound Money Defense League's recent work. The Gold Clause Contract. Per Title 31 of the U.S. Code, a gold clause is a provision that gives parties to a contract the option to require payment in gold rather than Federal Reserve notes. 
Gold clauses are particularly useful when designing long-term contracts as protection against the ongoing devaluation of volatile fiat currency. If more consenting individuals decide among themselves to require payment in gold, it would be hugely beneficial in broadening the use and acceptance of sound money. For these contracts to truly gain a foothold, they must be fully enforceable in state courts. So states should pass strong protections for requiring performance of parties to gold clause contracts. There's much work that needs to be done to enable gold and silver to become freely competing currencies to the U.S. dollar. Legal and tax barriers to free competition exist at both the state and federal level. But there are positive developments on several fronts right now. For example, Arizona and Idaho are actively considering legislation which removes precious metals from state income taxes. And Alabama and Tennessee are considering whether to join the ranks of over 25 states that do not assess a sales tax on the purchase of gold and silver. Fortunately for investors who simply want to buy, hold, and eventually profit from physical metal, doing so is already legal and easy. Well, now, for more on the mindset one top analyst believes you should have when it comes to investing in precious metals, as well as some key price levels he's watching on the charts, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview with the silver guru himself. It is my privilege now to welcome in our good friend David Morgan of The Morgan Report. David, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to have you on, as always. And how are you doing so far here in 2017? <laughs> doing pretty good, Mike. It's great to be on your show. Thank you very much. Well, as we begin here, David, we're off to another solid start to the year in the precious metals markets. Things look quite similar today to where they did a year ago. We also saw some early momentum in 2016. Uh, so what have been the key drivers in your view thus far in the metals markets, particularly the white metals, silver, platinum, and palladium, which have all outperformed gold to this point? What's behind the advance? Well, a couple of things. It's a lot like last year, I think, that First of all, there's always some contingent of people that are looking for a safe haven or a hedge. And, of course, that ebbs and flows with market conditions and perception. However, long-term investors realize that the financial situation on a global basis, the debt structure, is unsolvable. So I think there's that. There's always people that are adding to that. There's people that invest too much or expect the, market, the gold market or the silver market to move at a certain place, and it doesn't. So again, it has been close. As far as the white metals are concerned, it's pretty interesting. Number one is that platinum has been under the price of gold for months now, which is highly unusual. I mean, with my 40 years experience in the metals markets, when platinum reaches a discount to gold, usually it's a lead pipe cinch trade. You just basically arm it and you go, you know, long platinum, short gold. And within usually a few months, you are in the profit zone. Not true this time. Part of it has to do with the Volkswagen no-no with the TDI with their uh, diesel engine. And the platinum and palladiums are used in the catalytic converters for gas and diesel. And that's part of it. The other part is seasonality. I used to trade platinum and palladium quite a bit. And there is a seasonality in the first of the year for both the white metals. In fact, it's, it's almost a sure thing. Of course, there's no such thing as a sure thing. So that's part of it as well. There's a seasonality. And if you look at the fundamentals, I mean, platinum is under the cost of production. Most of it comes from South Africa. Their mines are a mess. Their work, workforce is a mess. They have a lot of problems. And so that puts some upward pressure on the price of platinum at some point in time, but it really hasn't become robust. I mean, obviously, as you said, it's outperforming gold, but not what I consider in a significant way. So, Mike, I last year thought, look, we're going to see a seasonality of gold and silver, and I thought it would go a month or two. And that's where I started the report in January when I put it out. And I'm a good uh, believer that the market knows more than anyone, regardless of the reason, regardless of the commitment of traders, so if you listen to the market, it will help you a great deal as far as how long the trade will take place, et cetera. So what I did was I let the market tell me where it was going last year, and we got to a point where gold and silver are doing really well in the summer, which is unusual. It's different than their normal seasonality. And I started looking at the commitment of traders closer and closer and closer. 
And I picked a point where I was highly uncomfortable. The sentiment was very, very high. And uh, I, I chose that as a point to off the trade. So what I do is I keep 75% invested in trade with 25% at the maximum. And I like to put profits. And then this new next bull market that we're in, it really, in my opinion, strong one, uh, uh, behooves yourself to be able to trade because the ebbs and flows are going to be rather dramatic. So if you can trade with part of your portfolio, you can increase your gains. So when I said all that to say this, Mike, and thanks for listening so well, I am just going to do the exact same thing again this year and hope you all get it right again, which means the market is tenuous. The gold community of traders looks more favorable than the silver one. There's a lot of my friends saying silver is going to go into a short squeeze imminently. Uh, I don't see that, but it doesn't mean that they're wrong and I'm right. It just means I don't see it, and they may see something I don't. But I'm just going to let the market tell me. I think we've got more upside in both the metals, but I do not think we're going to go all the way into the summer uh, like we did last year. I think we're probably going to go, I'm guessing now, another month or so. And, of course, I will update uh, premium members on the website. I mean, that's what it's all about because, you know, I do it real time and draw the graph and explain what's going on and also how the market reacts. In other words, if we get to this point here, I'll draw a line, I'll get the number, then the market is telling us the game is over and you should you take your profits. I got everyone in suggested as a 1660 basis to spot market. So if you look at 1660 on the chart and where we are now, most of those people that took that piece of education that I gave out of where I would enter are pretty happy right now. Yeah, absolutely. Now, there are some that uh, don't think we're necessarily still in a bull market. So talk about this idea that we're hearing from some of the bearish analysts who say that the first half of last year, where we saw a very strong advance in the metals, as you alluded to, it was nothing more than a bear trap. We remain in a longer term uh, downtrending market for gold and silver, and that was just a blip. That's what they've said. Uh, I know you're uh, calling for a strong year for gold and silver. So what is your response to the notion that the these rallies are just you know, fool's gold, so to speak. Yeah, great question, and thanks for that. I mean, as you know, I sent this article to you, one of the few. I don't write many articles for the public domain. I usually just do the interviews and post them on our on our blog and mail them out to our, our email list. But I was asked to do it exclusive. I sent it to you, and, you know, I started off by sitting, spending almost most of my life watching, writing, speaking, trading, investing, and listening to almost everything to do with the precious metals markets. Given that there's several insights that you, the market, have provided me over and over again at a level, rising my conviction into what happens in these markets. And I went on and said in that article that we are in a, in a situation where I do believe, with everything I've learned and know, that we are not in a bear trap, as you talked about. We are in a new bull market. And I'm putting, you know, pretty much my reputation on the line. And I alluded to these other people that say what you just said, that there's going to be a new low ahead. I don't see it. There's a few reasons. One of them is that silver is leading gold. That's one reason. Another reason is the volumes were vast last year. I'm not talking about 2017. I'm talking about all of the year 2016. Another thing is where was it on a year-over-year -year basis? The leading group of stocks that was the best year over year for 2016 were the mining sector. In other words, from January 1st, 2016 to December 31st, 2016, the number one performing sector was the mining stocks. And that was a almost a round trip because we went up, 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 up to the summer. I sold right at the top for the trading part of the portfolio. And then we went down, 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 down into the end of the year. And even with it coming down, the best performing asset. So, I really don't see it going lower. And these guys that are right, I just I made fun of myself for this article. I said, you know, if I'm wrong, you know, throw it up on your favorite, uh, you know, Twitter feed. I don't care. I mean, a lot of this stuff is probability. I was asked to give the forecast for, you know, what would the silver price be in 2017. I did this time what the banks do. I took it a little more seriously because I kind of look at these things as kind of a joke. I mean, what I do for my paid people is far more meaningful because I can get a better handle on it. Going to your house pretty hard. What you do is least squares linear regression. I did a least squares linear regression. It's just a curve fitting math formula you learn like first year in advanced math. And 
so it came out at twenty two dollars with a high band, like a Bollinger band, twenty two at the high and sixteen at the low. And I said, I'm I'm bullish. I'm taking the high, twenty two bucks for this year. So that kind of summarizes that part of it, Mike. If I'm wrong, I'm going to be first of all I'll take it like a man. Secondly, I'll be astonished. We had that rise in price on weak volume. And the drunken millers and some of these big funds were buying gold hand over fist. Then I would say, you know, I'm going to pause and I'm going to wait and see and I'm going to just be neutral. But that's not what we saw. What we saw last year was big money come in in a big way in large volumes, and that's where the price moved up. Let's dig a little bit more into some of the uh, primary catalysts here. I mean, what are you watching for in terms of some of the geopolitical events and some developments in the global financial markets that could have you reevaluating your outlook for 2017 and beyond to be even more bullish? Share a bit about those potential catalysts for higher prices. Well, unfortunately, we have a new administration that, in my opinion, may not take a long-term view and is looking more reactionary than forbearing into what, you know, the meaning of a certain uh, legislation or uh, edict is. So let me rephrase that. We have a lot of problems in the United States, and the world has a lot of problems globally. And most of them center around the banking system having a a debt-based monetary system. And that's really what needs to be addressed, because we cannot grow our way out of this mess. And and trying to do that may be something that gets people excited. It may put more people to work, and it may even improve the infrastructure. And I'm not against any of those things. But as far as a core value that's really going to have a meaningful impact on humanity, there is no such thing right now, because the problem really hasn't been addressed. It's putting the lipstick on the pig. Excuse the overused metaphor. So this is the situation. So what I see is if there's more tension, and it looks like there certainly could be, between, let's say, China and the United States, or Mexico and the United States, and we start doing what happened in the 30s with the smooth Hartley, in other words, more protectionism and more, you know, me first, you second, and that kind of an attitude, it will grow tension-wise between nation states, and it will have economic repercussions. And we're already seeing a contraction in the overall economy. So I am a bit, more than a bit, I am concerned how this will unravel. It's going to unravel one way or another. That is inevitable. That's mathematical certainty. The problem is you want it to unravel where you can uh, stay ahead of the flood. In other words, as another metaphor, if the water starts rising in the river, you can pack up the kids and the wife and the essentials, get in the car and get away from it. But if that flood is a flash flood, you're going to look out your window and all of a sudden the river's, you know, two feet in your house and there's nothing you can do about it. That is a metaphor for what I see potentially happening, happening. And that's not a good place to be because then you're going to get overreaction on the other direction, which means you might get into further currency wars and you're going to have a hard time. You know, once the flood is taken over, the flash flood, it's, it's impossible to make it Go, go away. And again, that may be a corny metaphor, but I mean it. I really want people to picture this in their heads because, Mike, I am more concerned that we're moving too fast in an ever-changing world that could have repercussions that we look back on and say, oh my goodness, we should have waited before we did that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, good answer, and I uh, echo those uh, those concerns as well. It does seem like a very tenuous situation, and who knows what it's going to take to uh, to get to that tipping point. Uh, expanding on the point here a little bit, uh, the market for physical metal has transitioned a bit with the election of of Donald Trump. Many of our customers are more optimistic today than they were under President Obama, which is certainly understandable. Uh, But that does not mean that precious metals will not do well, especially with rising debt, increasing global tensions, and a Trump administration that has been saying they want the dollar to weaken. So what are your thoughts on the need or lack thereof for physical bullion, given the new administration? Well, what's so interesting is being objective, and it's something I strive to do. I certainly cannot do it in the precious metals market. I'm just way too involved in it. But if you look at people that can be objective, you can look at, if it's an associates, which did a study years ago on uh, 
portfolio balance. There was a Harvard study, and there's a recent one done by CPM Group. And all three of those studies come to the exact same conclusion that regardless of economic condition, regardless of what's going on in the debt markets or in the equity markets, having precious metals in your portfolio will give you better overall performance. Wow, what a concept. So that means that if you're super bullish, everything's wonderful and nothing's wrong with the world, you should have some precious metals in your portfolio. If you're on the other extreme and think we might go another week before the whole thing collapses, you should have some precious metals in your portfolio. So it's basically something that is meaningful to get you the best performance under all economic conditions, and yet most people are never taught this at all. The reason being is that Wall Street really doesn't make much money in the gold and silver markets. They make their money in the equity and the bond markets. But they'll come around, and probably more on the equity side, which means you'll see more of the resource stocks, something that we spend a great deal of time doing in the mortgage report. But the studies that I'm mentioning is not resource stocks. It is not gold companies. It is physical metal. That's what they're talking about. Leads me in right into my next question there, talking about mining stocks. You've been spending a lot of time with mining company executives lately, both one-on-one at their mines and also at investment conferences. What's the outlook in the miners at this point? Considerably bullish. I mean, most of them are convinced, like me, that the worst is behind us and we are going up, but not rapidly. A lot of the people that were marginal in the business, meaning they had projects that were profitable at $25 silver, they're gone. People that were profitable at uh, $1,650 gold, they're gone. So the market's consolidated, which is is actually healthy in some respects. And uh, projects are getting funded. There is more uh, cash available for projects to be furthered. And again, mildly bullish. I think that uh, all these companies have gotten leaner and leaner. They've all pretty much cut their margins to all, for all practical purposes, as much as possible. And they're optimistic, but it's not, not like the early days in the beginning of the bull market. I mean, when you go back to the 2003 fours and fives, I mean, there was like a buzz. And you walked into an investment conference, be it a retail conference or a uh, investment conference of uh, professionals, it was humming. It was buzzing. Everyone just sort of knew that the bull market had started in a significant way. It's not that kind of feel at all. It's a feel like, okay, the best of the best have remained. Uh, there's good deals out there. Let's seek them out. Let's put our use our money wisely. And there's a few like me that are thinking, you know, two, three years from now, or maybe a year from now, I don't know. I'm actually thinking more than, you know, sooner than later, the buzz is going to get back to those early days of this bull market because, unfortunately, these debt problems can't be solved. So there'll be a lot of money drawn into this sector over the next few years. Talking about when we were fully in that bull market just a few years ago, another thing I was reading recently involved a a prediction you made back in 2011. You made the case that when silver reached $30 an ounce, the public would buy more silver above that level than they would below it, and and you think that's uh, going to happen again one day. Uh, Talk about why you think that will be the case. It's, It's an important point because many would guess that the public would be selling silver if the price got to that level, not buying. Give us your thoughts there. Yeah, well, when it happened the first time, uh, there was a lot of buying above 30. And if you look at a chart, silver stayed above 30 for about a year. In fact, if the silver was able to stay above 30 from then on, then you'd have great margins for the better silver companies like some are on the New York Stock Exchange and on, uh, you know, some are on the NASDAQ. I'm not talking about the speculative type of companies. And they don't have great margin to be able to expand, and you have a really good situation. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. So when we get back to 30, there will be some amount of people that bought it at 30 that will say, oh, I hate silver. It's finally back. I, I'm, I'm selling my silver. So you'll get calls from you know some of your people that will say, you know, Mike, I want to sell back my silver. And, of course, you make, you make a two-way market, and that's it. There is, and, and that will take place. But... You'll also have a lot of new buyers. And the reason being is once it gets over the 25, 26 level, and I'm just using that as a guess, and I think it's a good guess, the psychology of the market will change. And a lot of people that have given up on silver will become some of their biggest advocates again. 
and you'll get a lot of free publicity all throughout the Internet about why silver is the greatest investment, why it's going to outperform gold, why it's affordable, and all the, all the arguments that we've, you know, gone over and beat to death. They'll come out from new mouths. They'll go on to new websites. They'll be in new places on Facebook. And all of a sudden, the silver story will explode into new niches that it's never been exposed to before. So there'll be many new buyers for every seller that just wants to break even at $30 silver that will overwhelm the market. Now, that presupposes that there'll be enough going on economically that that buzz will be taking place. But that's how markets move, and so I'm nearly certain that's what you'll see. So you'll see this overwhelming thing, and then the people that sold at 30, you know, they'll have resistance. It could take two weeks. It could take two months. It's not going to take two years. But it'll take some amount of time to work through that level, and then maybe the next one up, there'll be some that bought it at 40, and it's, oh, man, finally, it's 40. I kind of want to get rid of this stuff. And then once it's in a, a new high, once you get up 40 and above, Everybody will buy it. I shouldn't say everybody. Many people will buy it at that new high because it's like, wow, I'm going to miss it. It's too late. Silver's got to go to 100. Look at the ratio. They'll, they'll, they'll know all the arguments from, you know, these new niches, these new places where they're getting the silver story for the first time, and they will believe that uh, they can't lose. And so they'll jump in the market. And so silver is such a tiny, little, bitty market any new buying will drive the price higher and higher and higher. And people that hold their profit won't sell because they don't know how high is high. So we'll see another move like we saw in 2011 where, you know, it went from 19 to 26, stalled out for a little while, from 26 to 48. And I made that trade. Everybody that was on my premium service saw me make it, and the ones that followed me into it were, like, super happy that I called the top on that. And, uh, you know, we're going to see that again, except this time, I think we're talking about uh, a move that's even higher than the, than the $50 level. But again, you know, I'll try to remain uh, humbled by the markets again. The markets have humbled me many times, and that means that it's possible, one, that uh, it might not go higher than that, or two, that uh, it'll act differently than I just outlined, but I'm pretty certain it'll be close to that. You've written a book uh, advising people on on the types of things that they can do when we get to that point. So uh, as we start to wrap up here, David, uh, talk about some of the things that you're working on there at the Morgan Report, and then also about that recent book that you and David Smith just released titled Second Chance, How to Make and Keep Big Money During the Coming Gold and Silver Shockwave, and and then anything else you think people ought to be uh, considering as we move throughout the year. Well, I'll start on the book. One thing that's really disheartening to me is many retail investors. They'll do what's called a round trip. They'll buy a stock, a gold, good stock, good, great gold company, a great silver company, and a few other, you know, lithium and cobalt and some of the stuff that we do in the report. And they'll go up and up and up and up, and they're very happy and tell all their friends and da 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 da. And they'll just hold it and watch it come all the way back down to where they bought it. That is not what you do as an investor. And so the book Second Chance is all about different techniques and how to kind of overcome the uh, the tendency that some people have to not take a profit. So we have several techniques like scaling out and whatever. Of course, you know, my biggest and hardest job will be to call top again. I've been very good at it so far, and I don't want to say that too often. I don't believe in jinxing myself or whatever, but... You know, calling an exact top is an amateur's game. I think you can do that again and again and again. No way. No one can. I've been lucky. I'll use the word lucky that I have done it every time. And mostly it comes from running this business. Because when we get just a plethora of new subscribers, that's way beyond what we get on an average day or week. That pretty much tells me, that, uh-oh, darn it, we're getting to the top. And that was one of the factors I used to call in the top the last time. As far as, you know, what's going on in the Morgan Report, this is something that was said to me, oh, 25 years ago, and I actually didn't like it when I heard it, but it's true. One of these old miners, I was talking at the uh, Society of Mining Engineers, the SME, and small group, and all these guys were pretty rough characters, nice people, but, you know, hard workers. And one old guy came up to me and he said, man, I've made so much more money in the paper silver market than I've ever made in silver. And I thought, I don't like that, really. But you know what? He's right. I mean, you get so much leverage in the mining shares. I'm not talking about futures and options or ETFs, which certainly can make a lot more there. 
on the moves up and down. But in the mining sector, I mean, some of these stocks just do phenomenally well. In fact, I was going to write an article for the public domain talking about, did you catch the move to $50 silver in 2016, question mark. And part of that gets some eyeballs on it, Mike. But what the hell is David talking about now? And what I'm talking about is one of our top tier picks. First of all, we picked out in 2016 in the January issue our best stocks for the year. And guess what? We hit the nail on the head at all of them except one. Our performance was like 215%. That's not even close to the IBD percentage that I outlined early in the interview. Now, there's, I think, 56, but I'm doing that from memory. You can check my facts. It's the idea that's more important than the exact number. But we were beating the uh, IBD index by a, a huge factor, like two, three, four hundred percent. Anyway, uh, there was one company that was uh, one of our favorites that went from like 414 up to like 19 and change. So that's the equivalent percentage-wise of silver going from um, you know, very low level up to a very, very high level in percentage terms. So that shows you that the right silver stock can perform much better percentage wise and do up a factor of like four or five fold. Whereas if you bought, um, the silver, you know, which did well during the year, no doubt about it, it started, you know, at that 14 low in, uh, early December 2015. And then the stocks bottom on the 19th of January 2016. And then we were off to the races for a while. So I think a balance is what's important. You know, people say, well, you push this and you push that. Well, I push balance. If you don't have metals, real physical metals that you could get, you know, at, at Money Metals Exchange, get a good dealer, one you could trust, one that delivers what they say they're going to, one that stands behind their products, one that makes a two-way market, one that helps educate their clients. Everything that you do at, you know, Money Metals Exchange, Mike, you and, and Stefan, and you've been good friends of mine. and. Never had anyone come back to me and sent me that, you know, everyone's come back to the, I'm glad I sent you there. And I spread it around, you know that, because I know most of the major dealers on the wholesale and retail side. But, you know, you do it right. <clears throat> but my point is that if you don't have physical precious metals, I don't want your business. If you do, and you want to go to the next level of making money, where you can do more in the paper markets than you can in the physical markets, but you own physical, which is the most important part, then certainly looking at the Morgan Report is, and I give a free chance. In other words, you get on our free list, and with our free list, we you know write every weekend something that either I compose or usually comes out of the Morgan Report, and we try to make it you know beneficial to everybody that reads our work. It is not the Morgan Report. Membership has its privileges. Membership means you are a membership uh, part of the website, which is a protected, password-enabled portion that has a vast amount of information, not only the monthly Morgan report, but the videos that I do on an as-required basis talking about the commitment of traders, how the markets are set up, why the bond market is about to fall, why the bond market has peaked, why we're in a distribution pattern in the stock market, why they're marketing up now to make everybody feel good, what's going to look like further out and on and on it goes. So, and the other thing that I thought was very important, because I try to put myself in the buyer's shoes. What do I really want in a newsletter? I've seen them all. I mean, I was a newsletter junkie in my 20s and probably early 30s. And I've seen most of these guys and what they produce. And I just didn't want to do that. I wanted to give a, a whole different, fresh outlook on this sector. Well, when I write a question to them, I want an answer. So we guarantee that we will answer all of our paid members, whatever question they write. Now, they're limited to two a month, which is pretty generous, really. And they can ask us darn near anything. But a lot of time it's on something we've covered in the Morgan Report. And then we put that question to letters to the editor and we ask for everybody's benefit. And, and on it goes. So it's it's one part of being a member of the Morgan Report that uh, that I would want. You know, I'd want uh, the person I was paying to be responsible to me. And if I had a question, I certainly would want, want to get an answer. Well, it's uh, fantastic stuff for sure, and I can uh, say with great confidence that if you are going to invest in mining stocks, don't do it alone. You need to take the uh, advice of, of a trusted analyst like David Morgan and the team that he has there. So it's uh, it's very worthwhile if that's a, a market that you're going to play in. Obviously, get the physical first. We both agree on that, but uh, David and his team can certainly help you 
uh, navigate those uh, those waters in the mining stocks because it's not easy to do on your own if you don't really know what you're doing. Well, well David, great stuff as usual. We always appreciate hearing your thoughtful analysis and your level-headed approach to these markets. Thanks so much for taking the time and for providing the, the service that you do there. Uh, we certainly wish you all the best and look forward to catching up with you again very soon. Well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to David Morgan, publisher of The Morgan Report. To follow David, just visit themorganreport.com. We urge everyone to, at the very least, go ahead and sign up for the free email list and start getting some of his commentary on a regular basis. And if you haven't already, check out The Silver Manifesto and now his new book as well titled Second Chance, How to Make and Keep Big Money During the Coming Gold and Silver Shockwave, both of which are available on the MoneyMetals.com website and other places where books are sold. Be sure to check those out. And don't forget to check back here next Friday for our next weekly market wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. For answers to all of your questions, or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds, call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.